Uh, keep going, I guess. Okay. <laughs> the, um, the, the, the fact is, you know, having made that mistake in 2014, why would, uh, why would Putin make that mistake today? Why would he agree to a ceasefire today when Russia has all of the advantages? The Ukrainian military is literally on its last legs. Just listen to the words of General Zaluzhny, the commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, speaking to the media the other day, where he said, hey, uh, I can beat these Russians. OK, that sounds pretty impressive. But here's the important part. I need 300 tanks, 500 infantry fighting vehicles, 500 artillery pieces and unlimited artillery ammunition. In short, he needs the British military. <laughs> so he, it reminds me of that movie Downfall, uh, you know, the German film that showed the last days of Hitler in the bunker where Hitler's around the table with his generals moving imaginary army. Where is Steiner? Send Steiner, send Wink. You know, and these moving armies that don't exist. And so here we have Zaluzhi saying, I can beat the Russians, but I need an army that doesn't exist and will never exist. Um, the Ukrainians have burned through their reserves. They have nothing left. They're sacrificing everything in this decisive battle at Bakhmut, which is the Gordian knot of the Ukrainian defenses. When the Russians break through there and they will break through, then the Russians will be able to bring, uh, you know, to bear the, the 300,000 mobilized troops that they have. Russia has a tremendous replenishment capability. Ukraine has no replenishment capability. The Russian burn rate is 10 times lower than Ukrainian burn rate. The Ukrainians are suffering 500, 800, 1,000 casualties a day. Yeah, that means that the Russians are suffering 50, 80, 100 casualties a day. That's a lot. But that's nothing like what the Ukrainians are suffering. This is a ratio the Russians will be able to handle. They have 300,000 fresh troops coming in, uh, trained, equipped. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is a bad time for, for Ukraine. And so this is why Time Magazine had to put Zelensky on the cover, because it's absolutely mm -hmm. essential, especially mm -hmm. at a time when Congress is going to start questioning, um, where did all the money go? Right. All the money was sent to Ukraine. Where did it go? Uh, fair question, no answer. Um, and so it's imperative that you distract people from the fact that we can't account for the tens of billions of dollars that we sent to Ukraine by putting Zelensky on the cover, elevating him to heroic status and uh, hoping that people will continue to blindly support him without asking any questions. I would assume that Time Magazine is not only published in the United States, but it's published in other countries as well. So the other countries are not questioning the fact that time made Zelensky the man of the year, correct? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. I mean, Time Magazine um, is primarily an online resource right now. Uh, so it's, okay. it's available everywhere. Um, you know, it, it, it used to be a respected um, out, outlet. Uh, not anymore, though. I, I, I think both Time and Newsweek have uh, become sort of the the laughing stock of online journalism. Um, you know, the, the Time Magazine Man of the Year used to be something that um, was a big deal. Uh, you know, it was a very big deal to be considered Man of the Year. Um, but nowadays, it's it's purely a, it's like the Nobel Peace Prize. It stopped being something meaningful, and it started being simply a political ploy. I mean, my God, they gave it to Barack Obama, who had done nothing. Right. Being elected. Uh, and, and since then, they've been giving it to people who, um, you know, aren't promoting peace, but promoting partisan politics that happen to be in vogue amongst the woke West. Um, you know, it, it, it's a joke. It's a joke award now. And uh, Time Magazine Man of the Year is a, is, is a, is a joke honor. It's, a, it's purely a political exercise. You know, when he was first uh, made Man of the Year, I was talking to some of my friends about it. And some of my friends said, well, Hitler was made man of the year back in the late 30s. So <laughs> I don't see any any distinction between Hitler and Zelensky. I mean, Hitler wasn't exactly, <laughs> you know, terrific for the Jewish people. Well, remember, the Holocaust hadn't started in 1939, and the world is pretty much blinded to... Uh... You know, Crystal Nacht uh, was ignoring it and uh, right. the plight of the Jews. Uh, but the other thing is how they're portrayed. Uh, Hitler, I don't think, was portrayed in heroic fashion on Time Magazine's cover. I think Hitler was portrayed more brooding, more threatening. Man of the Year 
is it necessarily meaning that you're the the best man it might mean that you're the most influential man man who is dominated or woman who has dominated the news cycle etc and in 1939 adolf hitler was one of the most dominant figures in the world so he was probably the most influential figure of 1939 hence he was put on the cover joseph stalin's been put on the cover vladimir putin's been put on the cover a number of people have been put on the cover uh, not necessarily because time magazine views them as um you know the 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 best um example of, of of humanity but as the most influential person of that moment mm -hmm. and i would not have objected to Zelensky being put on the cover as the you know the most influential person of the moment he zelensky has been everywhere on the cover of vogue everywhere um but they've portrayed him as this heroic figure and the article that supports the uh, designation is an article that is full of admiration and and you know fawning words of you know how wonderful this man is uh so that that's the difference you can't just simply say well adolf hitler was put on because that implies that Zelensky and adolf hitler uh, represent the same sort of um you know loathsome ideology in the minds of the time staff that nominated and put them up there no hitler was definitely not put up there as the you know the the, the paragon of virtue um Zelensky has been Zelensky if he was going to be on that cover should have been a scowling man overlooking the destruction of his country um, and threatening to have that destruction spill over into Europe uh, with lots of cold Europeans in the background Americans mm -hmm. in the gas pump shaking their fist at high prices um, you know and, and the world rallying against the United States that would have been an accurate cover instead we get Zelensky with all these brave Ukrainians behind them and he's a noble figure it's an absurdity you know, uh, Kanye West has been taking a lot of criticism for anti-Semitic remarks. And you and I and Joe Lombardo have talked about the Nazis in Ukraine. So are people still unaware of the uh, Nazification of Ukraine? And is Kanye West used as a diversion to make sure people don't really understand that? I'm going to be very honest, while I'm superficially familiar with the Kanye West um, crisis, uh, I don't follow him and I don't give a damn what he says. Um, okay. So I, I, I literally, I'm, I, I can't sit here and speak in a knowledgeable manner about it. Whenever I see uh, people of uh, you know in the entertainment world uh, spilling over into politics, I hit delete and uh, it's done because ultimately they're irrelevant. I know the larger picture of anti-Semitism and, and there's a discussion about this, a very important discussion. I'm not trying to trivialize it. And certainly probably what Kanye West said provides an entree into that discussion, but I can't sit here and speak about that in an intelligent okay. manner because I simply ignore it. I, I just don't care about Kanye West. Um, but <clears throat> when we talked about you know Bandera, uh, the, the Nazis in Ukraine, some interesting things have happened, um, at least from, from in my universe, because I've been speaking out about it quite aggressively for some time now. And um, I, I, I'm now getting a different kind of pushback, uh, which is fascinating when you think about it. Uh, people are no longer denying that there's a problem. Um, for instance, they're, they're, what they're saying now is that Bandera's vision of nationalism was shaped by his reality. That reality dealt with Stalin, and that in order to deal with the evil of Stalin, it was necessary for Bandera to be as evil or more evil to win, that this was a necessary evil. Um, and that's why the Ukrainians can look past the crimes committed by Stepan Bandera and appreciate him for what he represented in terms of defining Ukrainian nationalism so it's basically you know a you know it's an apologist uh type thing dis dismissing um the crimes committed by stepan bandera and simply saying that he's a symbol of nationalism that we have to respect the fact that the ukrainians get pick their symbols and that they're choosing to pick him not because of his crimes but because of what he stands for in terms of finding the ukrainian nation and so that that appears to be i don't think there's too many people um, I'll, I'll say this even amongst my friends. Uh, the other thing that's happening <laughs> is the more I press on Bandera, 
the less I get, no, there's no Nazis. No, that's overplayed. That they, everybody acknowledges. I mean, you cannot ignore this fact when Zinro Zeluzny, the head of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, takes a selfie with Bandera's photograph back of him. The commander of the Ukrainian Armed Forces is taking a selfie with Bandera in the background. So no one can deny that the, the, band, the Bandera ideology has seized Ukraine, is dominant in Ukraine today. What they're saying, though, is that uh, it's not what you think it is. It's not about the Nazi symbology, the Nazi ideology, the murders, et cetera. It's about the glory of Ukraine and Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, the other thing they do is uh, what I call whataboutism. So you say Bandera, and they go, yeah, but what about this, this fringe group in Russia that are Nazis that are working with Wagner? I say, what about them? They're Nazis. The Russians are Nazis. How come you're not criticizing the Russians like you're criticizing? So they're admitting that Ukraine has a Nazi problem now, but they're trying to obviate that by saying, well, Russia has a problem, too. But even though their their argument falls apart because the the, 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 the organizations they bring up are literally fringe organizations that have long been suppressed legally by the Russian government and their involvement, if any, in the ongoing fighting is so small as to be trivial and, uh, and, and, and meaningless, as opposed to the mainstreaming of Bandera ideology. Um, and and that what this shows is that uh, people are, are willing to go to any lengths to excuse evil, any lengths to excuse evil. And, and, and that, that plays out in, in our own Congress, where um, a year ago they were condemning, rightfully so, the Azov Battalion. And yet now they're inviting them into Congress and giving them um, you know, a, a forum uh, in the people's house uh, where they can espouse their hateful ideology. They can sell the paraphernalia with the symbology of Nazi ideology on in an auction, raising money in U.S. Congress for the furtherance of their um, of, 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 of their of their hate filled nationalism. Um, it, you know, people are able to um, come up with any uh, justification. Uh, to to continue to support Ukraine despite the clear links that exist between the Ukrainian government and the um, and Nazi ideology. Do you think Zelensky, Zelensky will survive this whole whole thing? No. Um, yeah. you, you see, right now, in in in, in what, what's taking place is um, the the West is tired of Zelensky. Um, the, the, he's he's used up. Uh, this Time Magazine Man of the Year may be his last hurrah. Uh, the person that's challenging him right now is uh, General Zeluzhny. He's the new hero of Ukraine. He's being promoted in the West as <clears throat> the man who can save this issue. Um, they and, and 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 indeed, a lot of the um, articles are coming out now. Um, when Zeluzhny talks about what's being done, he doesn't mention the presidency. He doesn't mention the role of Zelensky, he basically says, I'm doing this. I'm the one doing this. I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is um, this is a not so subtle uh, change in the emphasis being placed on who's important in Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky is, I believe, going to be pushed to the side um, and either encouraged to leave Ukraine or he will be killed. If he leaves the Ukraine, uh... Think he'll wind up in the United States? He could um, very, very, very easily wind up in the United States. Uh, according to uh, the media, he has uh, quite a nice home in Miami. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, he could he could go down to Miami. Um, what will what, be interesting is um, what his future will be. You see, if he's pushed out by Zeluzhny and the U.S. recognizes Zeluzhny, it'll be very difficult to uh, create a government in exile around Zelensky, even though Zelensky may very well try to do that. Um, but Zeluzhny eventually will have to surrender to the Russians. And when he does surrender to the Russians, the United States may very well say that he has lost all legitimacy and that uh, Zelensky becomes the new big ball, you know, the leader in exile and will try to build some sort of a Ukrainian resistance movement around uh, Zelensky. Um, so you know, they're, they're, that's that's uh, a reason why I think the West would like to keep him alive. It's also a reason why I think Zeluzhny will probably kill him. You hear so much on the news that the 
Russians are not doing well. And I mean, on cable news and stuff or reading the paper, from your perspective, what's the status of the war? Russia has stabilized the front. Uh, they're in the process of uh, destroying the final Ukrainian defenses and in doing so, uh, burning up the, the last of Ukraine's uh, meaningful reserves. Uh, Russia is getting ready to deploy 10 to 15 divisions equivalents of combat formations uh, that Ukraine has simply no answer to. Um, I think we're going to see um, you know, meaningful, sustained offensive military operations in the near future that are going to dramatically alter the reality on the ground, including Russia's seizure of vast, uh, uh, vast territories in, in, in Ukraine and the, the destruction of what's left of the Ukrainian military. As of right now, how many Ukrainians have died? That's a number that uh, nobody has a, a solid feel on. Um, I, I think the the right now it's it's plausible that Ukraine has suffered more than a hundred thousand deaths. Uh, it's probable that Ukraine has suffered closer to one hundred and fifty thousand deaths, um, and that the number of wounded, uh, when combined with the dead, will take the Ukrainians up to the half million point. Um, by the time this next phase of the uh, conflict is over, you could expect that number to double. So we're looking at a million Ukrainian casualties. How about in Russia? Significantly less. Um, you know, the uh, right now, uh, the Russians have probably all all together uh, suffered in the area. This includes the militias, Wagner, et cetera, um, anywhere between 15, 18,000 dead and another 35, 45,000 wounded uh, for, you know, uh, uh, you know, add that up, you get what, uh, let's, let's just say 60, 60, 70,000 uh, total casualties. Um, but as the war goes forward, the, um, the, the, the ratio is going to just expand. Once we get into the breakout, the collapse of the Ukrainian military, I think you're gonna see, um, the, the casualties just become catastrophic for Ukraine and much smaller uh, for the Russians. You know, the, it, as Ukrainians lose their ability to mass artillery fires, to maneuver in a cohesive fashion, coordinate their, their actions on the ground, uh, the Russians will be able to pick them apart piecemeal and, and destroy Ukrainian formations without suffering hardly any casualties. And we, we'll, see, we'll start to see, I think, casualty ratios more akin to what the U.S. experienced during Desert Storm where we inflicted tens of thousands of casualties on, uh, dead on the Iraqi forces. Um, and you know, we lost uh, you know, 130, 140 uh, people. Many of those weren't involved in, in combat. So I think we're gonna see something like that going forward as the Ukrainians are pushed out of these defensive positions <coughs> and are uh, you know, compelled to fight a maneuver war that they no longer have the resources to, uh, to engage in. We are really in the dead of winter now. What what does all this conflict in Ukraine and Russia mean to Western Europe? <laughs> Western Europe is going bankrupt. Uh, they're broke. Uh, they can't afford their energy. Um, it's questionable whether they'll have enough energy. Their businesses have shut down. Um, you know, their politicians are starting to feel the pinch. Another government just fell in uh, fell in uh, Slovakia the other day. Um, you know, we don't know what the future will hold for, for that government. Uh, people are talking about Slovakia going the way of Hungary, meaning breaking ranks with the European Union on Russia. And I think more and more you're going to see a, a divide in Europe as governments fall and the will of the people gets manifest. And the will of people is one that's decidedly anti-war in Ukraine, anti-Russian sanctions. Um, and here's the, the sad thing, as bad as this winter is going to be for Europe, and it's going to be very bad. Um, thanks to the Europe's blindness in terms of policy for, uh, formulation, uh, next winter is going to be worse, far worse. So <laughs> this isn't over. I mean, even if the conflict ends, say, in, 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 in summer, where I, be I believe this, this war is going to be over by the end of summer, um, even if that happens, it's too late for Europe. Next winter will be devastating. It will be destructive. Um, and there's no guarantees that Europe's ever going to pull out of this in the near future, uh, especially if they continue to 
embrace the policy direction, the sanctions-based policy uh, towards Russia. Um, Europe's only hope is to terminate the sanctions and hope that Russia is willing um, to, um, to re-engage with them in a meaningful fashion on the provision of, uh, of energy. We talked a lot of a lot about terrible stuff that's happening in the world. Let's talk a little bit about you. How, how's your website doing? Oh, you mean the uh, the the Scott Ritter Extra dot com? Um, I think it's doing well. Uh, we're we're okay. getting um, some attention. Um, uh, programs like this uh, do do well, get lots of views. So I think uh, you know when it comes to the whole purpose for doing this, from from my perspective, is to uh, is to expose uh, people to, you know, um, alternative points of view um, right. that they might not otherwise have access to. So I, I think the the enterprise, so to speak, the Scott Ritter Enterprise, is a, mm -hmm. a grand success. Um, you know, <clears throat> we'll we'll see. Uh, you know, we'll see how it fares going forward. But um, even if it stopped today. And uh, it all went away. I would say that it was uh, it was definitely an effort, um, you know, well well done. Uh, we, uh, you, me, others, everybody involved in in this, um, I think, have played a, an extraordinarily important role in bringing alternative points of view to a broad audience. And and, and Cynthia, it's a national. It's not just a national audience. It's an international right. audience. We're taking this debate, this discussion we have that we're having today is going to be seen in Russia, in Europe, in Asia. Uh, it's going to be seen by thousands, tens of thousands, in some cases, millions of people. Uh -huh. um, man, that's that's pretty good. You know, does, so. and, and, and again, it's it's not about us convincing people that we're right. I, that's never my 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 goal. My goal is to expose people to an alternative point of view. And it's up to them to decide what they agree right. with, what they don't. But it's difficult for them to make, um, you know, these kind of informed decisions if they're only allowed access to that which the mainstream media or the government says is, they're allowed to. We're providing an alternative uh -huh. that gives them a chance to consider all, you know, at least a broader range of, of viewpoints. And then they get to make the decision which way they want to go. And Ultimately, that's their decision, and I applaud them making a decision, even if it's against me. If they, at the end of the day, if they say, "Hey, we heard what you had to say, but we think this is 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 the way," that's good, because they're making, from their perspective, an informed decision that was at least influenced by what we had to say. So right. that's a positive thing, and I think we're doing good. I think 2022 was a good year to get us started. Unfortunately for the world, there's going to be a lot of troubles ahead in 2023. Um, and I'm thankful that we have something in place that can carry on into the new year to continue this uh, process of uh, expanding minds, expanding um, you know, information access, et cetera. So I want to thank you for allowing thank me you. on your, uh, your platform and, uh, and being a part of this process. So how's your book going? Well, I mean, it's um, who knows? I, I don't know. I don't have access to the full numbers. I I received a report from uh, from my publisher, but because of the delays in reporting uh, from the you know from Barnes and Nobles and from Amazon and, and such, uh, it's all zeros in terms of book sales. But we know books have been selling, uh, but it's hard for me to to say. Um, all I can say is that again, uh, thanks to you and. Uh, and others, uh, the the book has gotten some attention. Uh, people are talking about it. Um, uh, I think we just um, uh, uh, signed an agreement to uh, have it published in the Arabic language. Uh, we're close to closing the agreement wow. to get it published in Russian. The Italians are considering it. I think other nations are coming on board too. So, um, I think I think the book, you know, even if it's not a financial success, um, uh, you know, I mean, to be honest, part of the reason you write a book is you hope it sells and you can. You can you you know pay a couple of bills, but even if that doesn't work, I think the book's getting discussed. It's getting attention. It's uh, it's being considered by people in the right places, uh, and that makes the book a success. That's the most important thing from my perspective. When you write a book, is that people read it and that you inform them. They're educated, and hopefully, 
people could take action based upon what was in the book. And from that standpoint, I think the book's doing very well. So give it a little pitch. What's it about? Oh, well, the book is uh, Disarm at the Time of Perestroika. It's about the implementation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty told through the vehicle of uh, one of the first inspectors on the ground in the Soviet Union. That would be me. Um, so it's got a little bit of an autobiographical aspect to it, but it's more than, than that. It's more than a memoir. It's, uh, it's a history of the treaty, how it was negotiated, how it was implemented. It's a history of the times, uh, the Cold War uh, environment in which uh, you know, nuclear war was a real possibility and the importance of this treaty and, and preventing nuclear war by getting rid of these weapons um, and how the United States and the Soviet Union came together to work in cooperation. Uh, you know, they were the evil empire. We were enemy number one, but suddenly we're working together to get rid of these weapons, to bring on stability, et cetera. And I point out to people, as bad as things are today, they were equally bad or some cases worse in the 1980s. And yet we got out of it through the vehicle of arms control. And it's a template. This book is a template of hope. If you read this book, you're not only going to be exposed, I'm just I'm being frank here, to an aspect, a critical aspect, one of the most important arms control stories in the history of arms control. This was the seminal inspection. This was the groundbreaker. This is the one that brought on-site inspection uh, into the forefront of where human beings were going onto the territory of, of, of former enemies and working to you know, to, to do compliance verification of complicated treaties. This changed arms control forever. And this is the one that did it. And my experience is, you know, people keep saying, how do you become an expert, Scott? Because I'm one of the dumbest people you'll ever meet. You know, how did you Come become on. an expert? And I say, it's not because I'm educated on things. By being the first person to do it. When you're the first person to do it, you are by definition the expert. I was the first person to do on-site inspection in the Soviet Union. I helped write the book on it, and that book is Disarm at the Time of Perestroika. So it's a, it's a fascinating history of a critical time that no one knows about because you weren't allowed to talk about it. When the INF Treaty was in existence, none of this story could be told because the treaty prohibited inspectors from talking about their experiences. But when Donald Trump withdrew from the treaty in August 2019, then the Russians subsequently withdrew, that restriction was lifted. I was able to write this book. There's no other book like this. And as I said, this is one of the most critical moments, not only in arms control history, but the history of U.S.-Soviet relations. It also talks about perestroika, what was happening as Gorbachev sought to you know, redefine Soviet society and the troubles that that entailed and how it was linked to arms control. Uh, so it's a, it's a fascinating um, you know, history of a very important moment in time that nobody truly understands but it's also a template of hope. You read this book and you realize that as bad as things look today between US and Russia, there is the possibility of getting out of it. And the best possibility comes through the vehicle of arms control. This is a template of success that hopefully future negotiators, future arms control implementators can, um, to, can fall back on and say, yeah, this is, this is how they did it right back then. Maybe we can do the same thing today. Thank you, Scott. You've been listening to Scott Ritter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Scott, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Have a great day and good luck this evening. Thank you very much.